Hello, Dados. This episode is about legendary comedian Norm MacDonald. In September 2021, something terrible happened. Breaking news here at 5. We have learned this afternoon that Norm MacDonald has died. Now let's hear from the man himself. To misquote Twain, it turns out the rumor of my death is only slightly exaggerated. I'm just as relevant today as I was 25 years ago. That's right. Norm is as popular as ever, and there's still nobody funnier. Hear his astonishing life story today on Death in Entertainment. I promise you this. It'll be the truth. Every word of it. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing, anyway? Death in entertainment. Greetings, Dipod Universe. Hi. How are you? Can I talk? <laughs> sure you can. Hey, all right. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> That's what the people want. The guy to my right. I'm Kyle Plouffe, by the way. <laughs> and I'm Alejandro Dowling. The guy to my right. You already know him. Back by popular demand, Mr. Ben Kissel. Thanks hey. for having me, guys. Woo! Yeah, it's welcome. honor back. to be on the show. Thank you for coming back. And uh, you came back for a great one because we are going to laugh a lot today thanks to the great, the late great. Norm MacDonald. Yeah. You know, I'm so excited to fall back in love with Norm MacDonald because <laughs> that dude was a comedic genius, a total inspiration, and his era on Saturday Night Live completely transformed my life. Absolutely. Me too. I think 95, 96, that's one of the most underrated, hilarious seasons where it was Will Ferrell on and Molly Shan and Sherry O'Terry and Norm doing Weekend Update. And of course, Norm was so good that NBC just had to fire him. <laughs> yeah, right. which I'm sure we'll get into because God forbid you're actually funny yeah, on television. Exactly. And God forbid we're funny here on this podcast. Just a heads up that this is a true crime comedy podcast, so there will be some jokes in here. Uh-oh. There will be blood and there will be laughter. Yeah. Oh, my. So if you're easily offended, get out of here. Make yourself scarce. <laughs> there you go. feel like I'm home for Thanksgiving already. <laughs> Make like a tree and you know the rest. Yes. Uh, root yourself in the chair and enjoy the episode. <laughs> exactly. And let's get into it. Mr. Norm MacDonald was born in Canada. Did you know that? I did know that. Canada, I've said this before, we need a wall on the northern border. They've been coming <laughs> down, taking our comedian jobs for decades upon decades, and I'm sick of it. It's true. Right. They say that an overwhelming amount of really legendary, funny comedians come from Canada. I mean, <laughs> SCTV, that was one of those shows that was a gem you had a chance to watch that after Saturday Night Live, it aired on my local station. And man, SCTV, their sketches were a lot longer than SNL, but damn, those things were hilarious. Yeah. Absolutely. Joe Flaherty just yeah. passed away. R.I.P. And it was very intellectual. Like they would yeah. do parodies of Woody Allen and a lot of like cinema, old How fashioned. How you ever cinema. do a parody of someone like Woody Allen? What do you joke about? <laughs> what do you joke about? It's Sun Yi. Oh, <laughs> that was pre Sun Yi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Norm was born in Quebec City in 1959, October 17th. Wow. And his middle name, Gene. Okay. So we had Norma Jean and we got Norman Jean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to mess that up on your dating site. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have a different kind of evening. Although I would say between Norma Jean and Norm McDonald, <laughs> no, Norm Jean. I mean, either way, you're going to have fun. You are. Yeah. Both sort of tragic figures. Mm -hmm. True. And where he grew up, it's a French speaking area. But his family did not learn the language and they did not want to learn the language Ooh. either. His dad put the kibosh on that. Wow. <laughs> so you can imagine that must be a very isolating existence then. Of course, I think anyone who grew up with a great mind like Norm MacDonald's lives an isolating existence because even as a child, people just aren't quite as quick or as sharp as you are. And because of that, they probably treat you ironically like you're dumb. Yeah. Right. And he says he grew up poor, 
surrounded by old men on a dead farm. Oh my, what are we doing Epstein or <laughs> yeah. And we're on? back to Lou Pearlman. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, he says just for some reason everyone was older in the neighborhood and they lived on this piece of land that used to be a farm, but they were not farmers. Huh. Mm. Okay. Further isolation. Right. And his dad was in his mid fifties when he had Norm, so relatively older. Yeah. Very French. Surprised right. he didn't want to speak the language. <laughs> right. His dad dabbled in teaching. How do you dabble? Because he did not kick a kid every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it goes in Tuesdays. There's your lesson. I dabble in teaching. Sir, you're not allowed near a school. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm dabbling in teaching. With the other old men. Around yeah. <laughs> Norm had two brothers, and they went to a school on a military base where, get this, their English teacher was their dad. Mm. Oh, great. The dabbler. The dabbler. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Norm got good grades, and he was particularly good at math. Oh, I could see that. Bit of a prodigy in math. And he skipped several grades. I wish I could say that, but it would be lying. <laughs> right. I skipped fifth grade because I was homeschooled. Uh, I went to a very Christian school up to fourth grade, but I skipped fifth grade not because I was super smart, but because I my mom held me back until I was about seven and a half to go to kindergarten. And they're like, we can't have this guy living like a real life Clifford. Um, so we just- He's got an apartment. Sit. Yeah. He's 29 going into ninth grade. Uh, so You're I, breaking all the chairs. <laughs> yeah. I got to skip it for more- Age reasons. His brother, by the way, Neil, is a prominent journalist with the CBC. Oh, wow. He's like a Washington correspondent. Interesting. So as Norm got older, he remained good in school, but he started to rebel against the system because it was very rigid. It really wasn't his style, mm -hmm. if you can believe that. And he was a very shy kid, like Robin Williams, like a million other comedians. Mm -hmm. But he said he was extremely shy and that it was like a pathology. Right, right. I used to do this thing on the bus where I would see how few words I could say throughout the 90-minute bus ride. Because talking as a child is horrifying. It opens you up for nonstop ridicule. No matter how cool you think what you're about to say is going to be, it backfires. Yeah. I think silence might be the best way to go. Also, 90-minute school ride? A little bus ride? Holy Mine shit. Mine was that long. What? Yeah, because, yeah, you know, normal. I grew up in the outskirts of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, so yeah. it was a very long ride to get wow. to junior high. Fond du Lac? I'm from Stevens Point. We got some Scotty boys. Yeah, we yeah. do. A lot of Wisconsin going on in here. <laughs> By the way, the draft next year, April something, uh, it's going to be in Green Bay. I'm going for Ooh. all three days. We'll all go. Nice. Kyle, you in on this? Mm -hmm. I know you want to go to Lambo. I want to go get some cheese curds. Live that life. <laughs> oh, you're going to die when you try cheese curds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a bit of a dark chapter for Norm. Literally, he wrote about it in his book. So Norm released a book called Based on a True Story. Hmm. And yet, half of it is fake. I believe that. Very Tony Clifton, very Andy Kaufman. <laughs> yeah, so you're not sure what really happened and what didn't. But he does have a disturbing story about there was this old family friend he called Old Jack. Uh oh. And Old Jack lured him into a shed with the promise of seeing a trained squirrel. Oh, no. And when Norm got in there, there was no squirrel. It's certainly not a trained one. No. <laughs> and here I have a an excerpt of this passage. Hmm. I watched old Jack look from side to side before he turned his gaze on me. And his eyes flashed black like the wing of a crow. He closed the door and the inside of the shed went black. Then I heard the bolts. I forget what happened next. And then this next clip you're going to hear in an interview while promoting the book, someone asked him about this. And at no point did the trained squirrel show up, right? No. no. Okay. He unleashed his gaze on him. G-A-Y-S. There you go. <laughs> Real clever stuff. Yeah. And now we know this thing is on. Yeah. <laughs> the darkest moment of the book is you, you imply pretty strongly that you were sexually abused as a young man with the hand of a seemingly kindly family friend uh, well i just write what i remember happening yeah did that give you any pause first of all to to well i remember nothing i don't remember being uh 
Someone pointed out to me later that there seemed to be a, a passage where people would just naturally infer that something bad happened, but nothing bad happened that I know of. Mm. That's All typical right. Norm fashion. Yeah. He writes this really disturbing and vivid account at, that ends with the door being shut. Right. But then he's like, oh, wait, what are you? I wasn't inferring anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I've ever seen a squirrel do is water ski. <laughs> I, I can't even think of what would you, you can't. I've never seen one juggle or anything. <laughs> a trained squirrel. Norm should have been smart enough to know that was a load well, of bull. bull. No, I mean, I'm going to see the trained <laughs> squirrel. What are you talking about? I'll get lured in right now <laughs> with the promise to see the trained squirrel. <laughs> So we don't know exactly. He said that he had a memory lapse after that that lasted several years. Mm. Either because of that or it just was a coincidence. He just doesn't remember. The family ended up moving from this dead farm, and they went to Gloucester High School in Ottawa, Ontario. And Norm graduated at age 14. Wow. But again, he changed the story at some point and told people that he actually dropped out. More cred. I guess. Is Absolutely. that cooler? Street cred. Says, yeah, drop it out of school. It, dropping out of school will always be cool. Right. Yeah. No doubt about it. I like, mean, it's not the right thing to do, kids. Yeah. Don't do it. But I'm just saying, if you don't do it, just lie and say you did. <laughs> right. In Palo Alto, nobody will take you seriously unless you dropped out. Right. Yeah. At age 16, Norm attended Carleton University in Ottawa and majored in math and philosophy. But that didn't last long. He dropped out to study journalism at Quinn College. So he's exploring. He was never comfortable in academia. Right. Probably not nearly creative enough for him, just sitting there getting bored out of his mind. Exactly. Yeah. And so then Norm just ventured into the real world. He moved to Vancouver and worked odd jobs to make a living, like I do. <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> training squirrels. Yeah, oh, hey. No, I, I don't do that. Okay. But I will build a bed and <laughs> I'll put together a dresser for you. Oh, that's you great. Go. So Norm was one of those guys like you see at Home Depot in the parking lot that's waving you down like, you need any help? We have very different experiences <laughs> yeah. at Home Depot. but all right. You never see those? People just wave me. Do I need any? I need so much. What do you? What do you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Whenever you go to Home Depot and you have anything bigger than a sedan, people will wave you down and ask if you need help moving. Or oh, they know I'm basically unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> they know I don't need help with anything. And so he would stand in line with people and then jump on a truck when somebody needed extra labor. And he would have long days of working wherever in the factory or yeah. field. And he recalls that one time he jumped on the back of a garbage truck. And then at lunchtime, all of them went to this deli to eat and they stunk. <laughs> yeah, and so that. the place almost closed down. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You gotta sell you gotta smell pretty bad to make the deli smell worse than the deli. <laughs> to shut down. Right. That roast beef used to smell real good until you dirty boys showed up. And this brought him right to comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Failed at everything else. Yeah. Comedy. In 1985, Norm started doing stand-up, performing in clubs around Ottawa, like the famed Yuck Yucks. Yes. He was insecure on stage at first. One time he does his jokes, which Norm MacDonald, dry humor, mm -hmm. takes a while to warm up sometimes. Well, nobody was laughing, so he ran out of the room. I understand. Oh my! God. He was convinced he bombed, but there was this manager named Howard Wagman who was a fan of his. So he was like, Norm, Norm, wait, don't go. Like, come on, give it another shot. Like, Love it. Another fan of his was a waitress named Connie Valancourt. They briefly dated and then got hitched. Wow, Val wow. Valancourt? Uh huh. That is straight up an 80s comedy last name. <laughs> she stayed out of the spotlight. Norm is newly married and he started honing his craft and eventually made a splash at the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal. Oh. And within a year, 
Norm was named one of Canada's hottest comics by the Montreal Gazette. Wow, that's Canada for you. <laughs> Only in Canada can Norm be hot. Yeah. <laughs> His idol was Bob Hope. Fantastic idol. Because, as Norm said, he was never serious. So there's two kinds of comics. There's Richard Pryor, right. who's vulnerable, and you know exactly who he is. Then there's Bob Hope, who's invisible. Right, that's really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And of course, for Bob Hope, because you know his comedy, he was talking to people that have massive PTSD from war. Yeah, yeah. And so he knew how to like make those people laugh, which is exceptionally difficult to do because they've seen more death than you know ninety five percent of the world's history. Yeah, of people. And he viewed Bob Hope with an existential lens, where. Everything is reduced to the breeziest jokes possible. And so really, Bob Hope is more of a cartoon than a person. And he didn't need jokes to get laughs. Mm. That's an interesting idea. Right. If you have such a built-in persona like that, you really don't need jokes. Because can you even think of any particular Bob Hope joke? Oh. No, you just remember oh. his persona. Right, right. And Norm would go on to emulate his idol with his carefully cultivated persona, which was irreverent, goofy, and somewhat childlike. Right. And a mix of being acerbic and then sweet. And this underlying layer of, like, this dude is a genius. Exactly. Just plain funny is what right. it comes down to. And, uh, of course, his deadpan delivery, lots of wordplay. In 1986... Norm actually had his first bout with cancer. Really? Sadly, not his last. He was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Ugh. I didn't even know this about him. Yeah. yeah. And he tried to make jokes about it on the scene. Right. But the problem was nobody found it funny or they just didn't believe him. I mean, that's unfortunate because he should be allowed to make fun of the stomach cancer that he got. But this, I think, is crucial to his... Uh, sense of comedy too because later in life he would say that joking about dark stuff has no place in comedy like you can't joke about death and you can't joke about certain things because nobody wants to hear that shit but he was joking when he said that i think not really see you never it's knew with tough norm to tell. Yeah. you never because he is he's got a very dark sense of humor mm -hmm. yeah and he liked to fuck with you right <laughs> so him saying that I wouldn't be surprised if he meant the opposite. Right. Yeah. And I blame the whole thing on the poutine. Have you had poutine? <laughs> Canada loves this fucking poutine. I love poutine. It is basic. You got to come to Wisconsin and try a real curd, number one. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, I would, I would almost, the gravy? Ah, come on. Oh, gravy's Canada. so good. It's a bit indulgent. It's a bit indulgent. It's cheese curds and fries and gravy. Let's not make it. It's almost it. like they didn't know what to do with this meal. Like they were looking through the cupboard. Okay, what do we got? Exactly. <laughs> but they do have good bacon. All right. Which is really ham. It's also a fantastic movie. <laughs> it is. Canadian bacon. Yep. Speaking of John, uh, speaking of Canadian comedians, John Candy. The great, the late, another late great. Oh, they're all dead. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. But then again, I don't think any of us get out of this thing alive. That's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Norm took a year off to get better, and he did. After making a full recovery, he migrated to Southern California. Uh-oh. And he blew up on the L.A. comedy circuit. His big break came in 1990 with an appearance on Star Search. No, that's awesome. Star Search. That was the American Idol of yes. its day. The lore says that he went out there, did his set, and bombed. And that he got three-fourths of a star. Oh, good. Wow. And that Ed McMahon gave him a dirty look at the end of the set. He was just hammered. <laughs> All right, Ed McMahon, <laughs> he was giving everyone a dirty look that wasn't bringing him whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> But if you watch the clip, I don't think that's true. It's just a, it's, it's an average comedy set, and yeah. people were laughing. I, I would not call it bombing. Wow. And that led to a bunch of other things like those one-night stand specials and, right. you know, talk show appearances. 
And then also, not I'm sorry to interrupt, but don't forget the comedy backdrop. We had Howie Mandel, who was on top of his game, putting rubber gloves on his head. Being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so the comedy was slapstick. It was Gallagher. And then you got this Norm McDonald guy coming out there, and he's off and weird and not extravagant. So I could see the audience on a star search platform being like, "What? what is this? Why right. are you watching this? When's he going to pull the rabbit out of his pants? When's the squirrel yeah, going to start performing? Yeah, yeah, the squirrel. When, when, when's this fucking talented squirrel coming out? We're all still waiting for this squirrel. It's never going to happen. <laughs> That's such a good point because he essentially stripped comedy bare. Right. And Howie Mandel, when he would go on Carson, he brought an elephant out one time. Oh, Literally God. brought an elephant out. <laughs> that is great. He's a great writer. What a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good host. Yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Even though Ed McMahon was unimpressed, seemingly, Norm caught the eye of casting agents and got booked on the David Letterman show Ooh. that Love same year. Failing up to the top. Also, Letterman and Norm, perfect duo for comedy because that was David's style, too. Totally. Yeah. Making people uncomfortable, squirm a little bit, yeah. but laugh ultimately. Absolutely. And if you're in need of gum, oh, well, if you have gum, rather. <laughs> Got any gum? Uh, David Letterman will be your friend. He <laughs> is in need of gum. And Norm would go on to have a David Letterman impression mm -hmm. on another show yes, that I will get into. He went on to appear on Letterman something like 25 times. Wow. One of his favorite guests ever. And you know... Comparing them, like you said, it's so interesting. Another important thing that they basically weren't afraid of that really helped their material was not being afraid of the silences. Right. Because sometimes the laugh wouldn't even come for another 20 seconds after they said the punchline. The silence is so fun, mm -hmm. especially once you get comfortable enough to live in it. It's total peace. Yeah. And you just stare at someone until they laugh. <laughs> yeah, or don't. We're all, we're all in this together now. Yeah. I don't care. You want to be miserable? I'm fine being miserable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Roseanne also took notice, and she hired Norm as a writer, as a change of pace from the usual Harvard guys. Yeah. And her show was the biggest thing on television at that time, so... Mm -hmm. They say Star Search was his big break, but I think really Roseanne took him to that next level. Yeah, and if she wouldn't have uh, utilized the tools of our time, she would still have the number one show with Roseanne because when it came back, uh, it was number one again. It yeah. was. That's how powerful that show was, and mental health is a real issue. I it really thought the is. bitch was white! <laughs> <laughs> I mean... That's actually going to come into play in Norm's story mm. later on because he got involved in that. Oh, man. And it backfired out. It always Oof. does. But more on that later. Yeah. <laughs> in 1992, he and wife Connie, the waitress, what was it? Valancourt. Yes. Yeah. They welcomed their only son, Dylan. And Norm loved being a dad. A year later, he joined the cast of Saturday Night Live. Awesome. As a writer slash featured player and then a main cast member. Still my favorite Bob Dole impression of any Bob <laughs> Dole impersonators. He was such a uh, underrated mm -hmm. character actor. He yes. was great. Anytime they gave him a character to play, he crushed it. And yet he claimed that he didn't do characters and he was terrible at it. And yet all the ones I can think of, Larry King, yep. David Letterman... Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds, Bert? Turd yeah. Ferguson. <laughs> yeah. All hilarious. Big hat. Yeah. <laughs> and he, but the thing is, I suppose, maybe to give him some credit to the, if he didn't believe that he was good at characters, which obviously was amazing, he never lost himself in the characters. He's not like a Jim Carrey type or someone who like transforms themselves. Mm -hmm. like, like when Jim Carrey played uh, the aforementioned um, Andy Kaufman, mm -hmm. you don't see Andy. I mean, no. I'm sorry. You don't see Jim. Yeah. All you do is see Andy. But with Norm's characters, you always saw Norm in the background. Yeah. You're like, this is fucking hilarious. Right. <laughs> Again, though, that goes to the Bob Hope thing. That's his built-in persona that is always there. Right. And so maybe that's the key on why it's always funny. Right. Like, he can't fail at that point, even if the impression sucks. Totally. And it was Jim Downey, the head writer, who noticed Norm. And what do you call it? Like, sniped him? From Roseanne. Okay. Oh, nice. 
so he, yeah, he is moving up in the world. He joined in the 93-94 season. And that's crazy because, well, I guess stealing to go to another network, I was, I'm was i surprised that there's no non-compete clause with that, going from a writer from one big show on ABC to go to NBC. I don't know if you remember this, but Roseanne was not the easiest person to work with. Yeah, true. And so she would, <laughs> she told one writer straight up, you're fucking fired. Get out of here. So I imagine they had short contracts. Yeah, true. I would imagine that as well. Yes. So it was very uh, fortuitous for Norm to get that and just keep coasting and then get on SNL. He did say that Jim Downey had talked to him and Norm was under the impression that it was a go. Mm. So he quit Roseanne, mm. went out to New York City, and then they told him, okay, you're going to audition for Lauren tomorrow. Oh. And I was like, oh my God, what's got going it. on here? That's I thought funny. I had this in the bag. Oh, and so he has to, and, and they're like, okay, you need two characters, you need two impressions, and Norm just had to come need, up with shit. I need shit. two fucking shots and a bullet. Is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but Lauren thought he was funny. Thank and God. That's all that matters. So he was in. And then he succeeded Kevin Nealon as anchor of Weekend Update during the 94 95 season. Kevin Nealon, also underrated Weekend Update, dude. Oh, oh yeah. He's great. Real funny. What was that? The um, subliminal man? Yeah. <laughs> and his, he would, uh, what was his head? It was the globe would be spinning and then it would just turn yeah. to Kevin Nealon's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was very funny, too. And Norm beat out SNL vet Al Franken who was desperate to get the anchor job at that point. Wow. Mm. But they just, they relegated him to Stuart Smalley. That's interesting. I could have seen Al doing well at that role, actually, as well. So mm -hmm. It would have been different. It would have been much flavor. different. Yeah. Norm ended up being Chevy Chase's favorite, because Chevy Chase is the OG. Yeah. And he thought Norm was the funniest of all the update anchors. Wow. Besides himself, of course. Naturally. Yeah. He's still Chevy Chase. <laughs> And Norm applied the same rules he used for stand-up comedy for the update chair. We're going to take anything joke-like out. Right. And it's going to be very simple. He did not care what the audience thought. Essentially, they're doing it for themselves. Him and Jim Downey, whatever made them laugh was Great. the rule. That's how you got to start. You can't, there's no way to go into comedy trying to entertain a hundred people. You got to make yourself laugh first and just trust that most of humanity is kind of similar. Mm. Yeah. This is interesting. I didn't know this is kind of a footnote. He said fuck once on air, <laughs> but nobody <laughs> noticed. Wow. <laughs> no. Meanwhile, there was unfortunately one of our other subjects, Charles Rocket, mm. who said it 15 years earlier yeah. and it destroyed the show. Like the next week they fired everybody. Jeez. So Norm got lucky oh my <laughs> yeah. God. that he has that understated delivery that they didn't even notice. The power of words. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so stupid. This shit has been going on forever. People get canceled or fired for the dumbest shit. It's really? Like show, that's show business right. 101. Yeah, like because when you're standing out there, especially live, sometimes things come out of your mouth. You're like, well, what did I just say? Right. And to hold someone to that. For the rest of their career and life, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. I mean, nowadays he could have won, for, ran for president, yeah, <laughs> just true. on the fuck platform. Yeah. <laughs> Our former president comes into this later yes. on too. Oh. Freedom, unity, cuckery, kisses. <laughs> Norm suffered panic attacks on the side. Much like fellow cast members Jay Moore and Sarah Silverman. Mm -hmm. Jay Moore wrote about this extensively in his book on SNL, Gasping for Airtime. Yeah, I so that's that. a real thing. It's very intense to be in that cast, I guess more so at that time. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's different I now. I think it still is. It's yeah. live TV. But they stay up all night, and yeah. they have to put that show on every week. I mean, it's just I crazy. It's a stressful-ass gig. Absolutely. And so what was going on in the culture at that time on the show itself, 94, 95, when he takes over the update chair, it was considered the worst season yet. That classic they, Saturday Night Dead headline. They said that all the time whenever a new cast came in. That was that was my favorite, one, one of my favorite seasons. That's Spade, Sandler, Farley. Yes. The goats, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. 
the worst seasons on SNL were from what seventy five to eighty, right, or whatever the last, the second five, the second cast, the the, the Dick Ebersol years. Yes, those were the worst by a mile. Eddie ahead. Murphy was the main <laughs> standout in those years, and and, and uh, Piscopo, and, and Piscopo, then, and then she would go on to be, in my opinion, the greatest comedic actor in television history, uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. Right, and Larry David had a short stint. As a writer. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so this season, they were constantly being attacked in the press. The one bright spot, though, that all the reviews agreed on was that Norm was great on Weekend Update. Yeah, because he had Opera Man as well. <laughs> <laughs> he, he introduced the world to Opera Man. Yeah. I, whatever critic. Whatever critics. <laughs> <laughs> and then off the show, out in the culture, one big event was O.J. Simpson. What? He, what happened? He was arrested for the murder of his ex-wife and a waiter. Nice. <laughs> Ron Goldman, a human. Yeah. I, I, come on. Yes, a human being. Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown, very sad. Yes. But Norm was not afraid to make jokes about it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. By the way, when I say and a waiter, I'm literally quoting a Norm MacDonald joke. Yeah, it's the That you'll hear oh, oh, in gotcha. a few minutes. I, I do feel for the victims. <laughs> of course. <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting. Everyone thinks that Jay Leno was so milquetoast. But when the trial happened, he had the dancing Edos, of course, Judge Edo from the case. So Norm <laughs> MacDonald, the fact that he got in and he got in trouble for making fun of OJ, it became a strange kind of punchline yeah. yes. for even the mainstream comedians. Mm-hmm. But the digs were so hard at OJ's expense that Don Olmeyer just couldn't handle it. No. Yeah, it was his buddy. Yeah. So first, let's hear a couple of these jokes. Well, it is finally official. Murder is legal in the state of California. (laughs) And the Pope came out with a book this week, which contains a series of essays examining faith and morality in today's secular world and the changing role of the Catholic Church as it approaches the 21st century. The book is entitled, God Himself Told Me That O.J. Is Guilty. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. In other book news, Prince Charles released an autobiography in which he states that he never loved Princess Di and that his father pressured him to marry her. The book is entitled, Of Course O.J. Did It. I mean, come on. <laughs> like the crowd, half the crowd doesn't even get it. Like, yeah. What is he talking about? He OJ, just went in. He wouldn't let it go. Yeah. No. <laughs> in his book, O.J. Simpson says that he would have taken a bullet or stood in front of a train for Nicole. <laughs> Man, I'm going to tell you, that is some bad luck when the one guy who would have died for you kills you. That's (laughs) That's the best joke. You don't get worse luck than that. (laughs) This one, though, is my personal favorite. According to retailers, the most popular Halloween mask this year is O.J. Simpson. And the most popular Halloween greeting is, I'll kill you and that guy who's bringing over your glasses or treat. Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> By the way, it goes on another 30 seconds of him just sitting there silent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's killing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, this crowd is loving it. And, you know, Norm did jokes about other people, too. It wasn't just OJ. Yeah, that's true. One of his other favorite targets was Michael Jackson. Oh. And I remember when he said, there's some shocking news this week when... Lisa Marie Presley and Michael Jackson have filed for divorce. Her friends say that, you know, she's more of the stay-at-home mom type, and he's more of a homosexual pedophile. (laughs) Well, there you go, Norm. (laughs) And now they're all hanging out together in the next life. They are, actually. That's so true. Lisa Marie, too. Wow. Uh, Everyone's dead. Everyone's dead except for us. It's insane. Dirty (laughs) Work, my favorite Norm MacDonald movie of all time. I think one of the only ones that he ever starred in. Yeah. That whole, other than Artie freaking Lang, Mm -hmm. the man who snorted a goddamn mirror, Mm -hmm. who's still alive. Other than that, everyone's gone. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad. Wow. For a period there in the mid-90s, Norm was very hip. And he was considered politically savvy, despite his own opinion. But in 1996, Norm appeared as a reporter in The People vs. Larry Flint. Love that movie. So 
Milos. I don't know how Courtney Love was able to play a drugged out, just a t- cock crazy woman. <laughs> I, what a stretch. Yeah. What a stretch. The that acting actually, chops. Yeah, that's wow. actually a great weekend update bit with Norm, where Molly Shannon plays Courtney Love. Oh, nice. They're, and he's like, How'd you do it? How'd you get into character? And she's like, what? <laughs> Don't touch me. I know. I have a, got a couple of hot stories about uh, Miss Love. But... Oh, yeah? You met her? No, no. I know a couple of people that did. Uh, she likes to show off. She likes to be nude. Okay. Uh-huh. Like Britney Spears? No, but not like Britney Spears. Like Courtney Love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm with you. So Milos Foreman was a fan of Norm's from SNL, and- Norm went out to dinner with him, but he said that he had to pretend to be knowledgeable about current events to fit in with everybody Mm. because Milos thought he was some smart guy. And then he's like, I'm going to put you in my movie. And Norm was like, no, you don't get it. I don't know how to act. Yeah. (laughs) And he tried to talk him out of casting him. But then eventually he gave in. And Kyle, this is one of your favorite stories. Oh, yeah. He's like, give me a small part. And he finally got one. But then he's in the scene with Woody Harrelson and... uh, they're just talking before the scene, and then all of a sudden, they're ready to go. And then uh, Woody Harrelson's like, uh, you want a beer? And he's like, no, I don't want a fucking beer. What are we doing? We're supposed to be acting here. And Milos Forman was like, cut, cut, what the fuck was that? He said that Woody Harrelson was so convincing as a, just like acting that he didn't even realize the scene had started yet. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Norm MacDonald would actually go on to have a small part in another Milos Forman movie, the one we talked about earlier, Man on the Moon, mm-hmm. where he played Michael Richards. Oh, interesting. During the Fridays segment. Yeah. And then in 1997, Norm hosted the White House Correspondents' Dinner, <laughs> where things started off a little shaky, but then he won the Washington crowd over, and President Clinton himself, who was on crutches due to knee surgery. Oh, isn't that ironic? Norm quipped, You are handicapped in the President of the United States. You must have an unbelievable parking spot. (laughs) Not a bad take. (laughs) He then urged Clinton to use medical marijuana and actually inhale. Don't even get me going on what Clinton did with our criminal justice system. How many people being put behind bars? How many super predators were put behind bars? Okay. (laughs) Didn't he try to stop Bin Laden first? <laughs> no, he didn't. He could have killed him in 97. He, did, he chose not to. He just a little Kosovo bombing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just saying he went three, <laughs> prison population. Uh, it was threefold after he left office. Not to get political. No. <laughs> no Meanwhile, tensions started to build at Saturday Night Live with Norm and NBC president Don Olmeyer. With NBC president Don Olmeyer, who was a friend of OJ's. They were old golf buddies. All right. And Norm never stopped with the jokes because obviously the civil trial then went on after the criminal trial. Yeah, it's pop culture also. Well, it's fine. Tell that to Don. Exactly. Trial of the century. And in, you remember that book, The Oral History of Saturday Night Live, where it was interviews with the cast? Live from New York, it was Saturday, it's Saturday Night. That's think, it. And uh, yes, I had that, and I read every single one of those. It's and, a great book. Uh, it's just the best. It's the perfect bathroom reader. It is. It really <laughs> is. So here's a quote from Don Olmeyer from that book. I put everybody in NBC in a very awkward situation. I was brought up that you don't desert somebody who's been a friend for 27 years because he's at his worst point in life. I like that. I actually appreciate that from him. But that doesn't mean also you can't make fun of him on Saturday Night Live. Right. So he told Norm to please cut back on the OJ jokes, no pun intended, (laughs) which were abundant and merciless, as we heard. My question is, though, why didn't Don go after Jay Leno with the Dancinitos? Because that's more silly than, you know, pointed. No pun Also, intended. let's be honest. Uh, yeah. Let's take another step. <laughs> uh, Jay Leno had a hell of a lot more clout. Right. And chin. Yes. And, okay, I'm done. But Jay, I mean, a cut above the rest. <laughs> yeah. Jay Leno was a hell of a lot more powerful than, uh, than Norm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Probably made the network a lot more money, oh, too. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Because let's be honest, money talks. Yeah, I mean, Norm did it for seven minutes once a week, and Jay did it for <laughs> an hour every yeah, night. Yeah, right. Norm continued with the jokes anyway. He didn't care. And Olmeyer had first wanted to get rid of head writer Jim Downey 
who by then in 1995 was relegated to just the update. And then Dom became obsessed with firing Norm. He claims ratings went down during Weekend Update and that the laughs were few and far between. And this was embarrassing for Lorne Michaels publicly because people were like, wait, Lorne, I thought you were in charge. Why are you right. taking orders from Don Allmeyer about the show you created? So things came to a head a couple years later, late 97, the same week Chris Farley died, actually. Mm. Norm heard whispers he was getting axed. After coming back from Farley's funeral in Wisconsin, nobody would tell Norm directly if he was fired. So listen to this. Norm called up Don Olmeyer himself. And, wow. And he was shocked to hear from Norm. And so then Don was straight up with him. He confirmed the rumor was true and cited the lack of humor as the reason. Well, that's not the right reason. No. I mean, I just tell the truth. If you said that, if you thought the content was wrong, uh, the humor was great. Yeah, that's what he said on uh, Letterman when uh, Letterman was asking him why he got fired. He's like, that's, ah, he said it wasn't funny. That's so classic. Well, that's that's bad news. That's entertainment 101, <laughs> though. No one having the balls to tell Norm what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't mind if I ask you a question? What's that? I hear today, I hear this story, and there's like this press release, you get your ass fired. Is that yeah. true? No, you didn't get fired. Yeah, they fired No, me. they didn't fire you. No, I'm serious. <laughs> I, I'm ta I talked to a guy that said I'm fired. They said that this guy, Don Olmeyer, turns out to be the president. Yeah, now I know Don Olmeyer, and yeah. just between you and me, he's an idiot. Oh. <laughs> At least Dave wasn't afraid to. Well, he's on his CBS, mind. right? Yeah, and he was also fired by NBC. Right. Yeah. So yeah, uh, not a great time for Norm. In uh, that's a blessing. That's a blessing in disguise. The Lord works in mysterious ways. He got more fame. He got more clout, and now he's free to do whatever he wants. That's true. His last update was in December 1997. Colin Quinn, who was a friend and ally of of Norm's was put in a tough spot when he was offered the update chair, but he had to take it. Yeah, yeah and I I don't say anything negative about people, so I'm not going to say anything about Colin Quinn. Oh, so you <laughs> love the guy. Yeah. Oh, damn. Did you ever watch his? Did you see the weekend updates? Oh, no, it wasn't oh, yeah. even close to Norm's. It was, you know what? And I like Colin Quinn. I think sure, he's, he's funny. Yeah. But for some reason, his weekend update did not work. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying a thing. <laughs> Well, I said it. <laughs> so Quinn accepted it with Norm's blessing. There was a big backlash at SNL. Suddenly when Norm was gone, everyone changed their mind. Mm. They're all like, oh, my God. No, 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 Norm, you're really leaving? Why? Like, let's make this work. Like, Or why not just do a weekend update till the, the end of the season? Why yeah. change now? It's like when you get a divorce and then you start dating again, and all of a sudden the person that asked for the divorce is like, how would you ever date somebody other than me? It's like, yeah. you asked for the divorce. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a friend of mine who's going through that exact experience right now. Oh, the worst. And in the media, it was very much like big corporation versus the little guy. Right. As you said, lots of great publicity for Norm, though, because he's the hero in this story. And from that same book, Live from New York, here's a quote from Norm about the situation. I was never bitter. I always understood that Olmeyer could fire me because he was the guy the, that owned because he was the guy that owned the cameras. So that didn't bother me. He seemed honest to me about it, straightforward. I was always happy that SNL gave me a chance. Great. That's the only way to handle it. And that is interesting because you just said that, that you actually appreciated Olmeyer's honesty in the situation. At least he told him. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people find out in entertainment that they are fired by, like, the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't even tell him. They maybe shoot an email out or something like that, if that. And in a strange way, Norm appreciated that, too. Like, not only to tell him he was fired, but to say it's because he didn't think he was funny enough. That's truth. All right. That's not... That's wrong. No, yeah, exactly. It's not an objective truth. And Norm left the show entirely by March 1998. Just in time to promote his first big screen starring role in one of Ben's favorites, I Dirty love, Work. Dirty Work. Classic. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Every line is a joke or leading up to a joke. One of the greatest written films of all time. And Bob Saget, R.I.P., man, just crushed it with his directorial debut. Really did. And that surprised a lot of people. But 
he actually won a Student Academy Award years earlier. Like, Bob Saget was a filmmaker. Genius guy. Not just Danny Tanner. Right. Yeah. And the movie was not produced by Lauren Michaels, interestingly enough. So it didn't have that. Maybe it was a little too blue. I don't know. Maybe. But the thing is, it was supposed to be a hard R comedy. Yeah. And then it was edited down to PG-13. Mm. I would love to see the hard R version of it. Well, that's what Bob Saget was working on. He was working on an edit of it. Mm. And then he died. Oh. He was also working on a script, a sequel. Wait, are we talking about, going back to Norma Jean, are we talking about big Hollywood murdering Bob oh, Saget? Bum, bum, bum. They did not want you to see the original <laughs> edit. Dirty work, hard R. <laughs> <laughs> they actually have jobs and they hate it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, the plot centers on a revenge for higher business. And I want to play a little snippet here of the trailer. And I have a little backstory to this trailer. In sixth grade, we did a, it was like career day. And you got to choose from all these presentations that day, three. You got to choose three programs you wanted to attend that day. Yeah. And one of them was at the movie theater. It's fantastic. Yeah, like if you want to get into the movie theater business, <laughs> I don't know, it was dumb. So then I'm like, of course, I want to go see the movie theater because yeah. it just opened our, our new one in Fond du Lac. Wow. So we go there and they made a trailer presentation for us of like the Newton Boys and some other movies. And the last trailer in this presentation was for Dirty Work. That's hilarious. And based on this snippet, you'll see why the owner of the theater came barging into the room apologizing to the <laughs> teachers. Well, you got a dead hooker in the trunk. <laughs> no, it can't be. I've never seen so many dead hookers in all my life. God knows I have. For anyone too weak to fight back. We're in prison. You know what prisoners do to each other all the time? All right, let's go. You sure you don't want him to? For anyone who's ever landed on the bottom, <gasps> your time has come. You didn't count on my loyal army of prostitutes, did you? Are you ready for some crazy rough sex? <laughs> when I say let's go, you go. Time you shut your cake hole, you'll go. Hey, hey, <laughs> movie line. <laughs> oh, how's that looking, baby? He was supposed to keep driving. <laughs> Dirty work. Nice. Needless to say, <laughs> the kids loved that trailer that the day. Best. <laughs> Unfortunately, the movie was not a hit. That's crazy. Yeah, it did not make its money back by far. It opened at number eight on June 12th, 1998, narrowly edging out Titanic in its 26th week of release. June 12th, exactly four years after the O.J. Simpson murder. Huh. Mm. <laughs> June 12th, 94, right? Are you saying that OJ had something to do with this? Yes. Very possible. OJ's revenge. Olmeyer did have something to do with it, though, because he blocked ads for the movie from airing on NBC. And that, I mean, back in the day, that's the only way that a, a boy from Wisconsin like ourselves would have known that it exists. Yeah. And then they realized that was awful. And so the ban was lifted after two weeks because it was petty. Wow. Right. But still, the damage was already done. One of the bright, or, or I mean, one of the positive things to come from that experience was obviously the lifelong friendships he forged with Artie Lang and Bob Saget. In fact, to promote the movie, Norm appeared on the Howard Stern show with Artie, and Howard liked Artie so much, he filled the Jackie chair years there later. You go. So everything kind of connects. Mm. Also notable about Dirty Work. It features the final posthumous appearance of Chris Farley. I know that. Wow. Yeah, he was dead by the time the movie came out. I don't think he had a chance to see it, obviously. No, he didn't. And, it was months uh, later. Same with Almost Heroes, the one he did with Matthew Perry. That's probably for the best you didn't see that one. but <laughs> This yeah. one's better than that one, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. G7. You just said G8. <laughs> if you like pina coladas. <laughs> Why do you get a pull cue? <laughs> Such it's a fantastic film. Yeah. His part alone is one of the most hilarious also, things ever. Uh, who's the Jack Warden? Yeah. Jack mm. Warden's the right. dad. That cast is so fantastic. Chevy Chase is the Chevy doctor. Chase. So he's dead. So Remember that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Norm went on to star in one more movie actually called Screwed. Oh, yeah, with sure. Screwed. Chappelle. Chappelle, yep. I remember yeah. that. 
Not as good as dirty work, but it has some laughs. Yeah. Not as bad as they made it seem either. Also wasn't a hit. So yeah, dirty work didn't really ignite his film career. After that, in 1999, Norm and Connie, Connie Valancourt, yeah. they divorced oh. after 11 years. And there were some rumors that he dated Al McPherson and Julia Roberts. Oh, my. But Norm said that he didn't kiss and tell. Wow. Interesting. And he never had a significant relationship again, staying mostly single for the rest of his life. Hmm. And at this point... Around 99, he excitedly moved back to California to be closer to his son, Dylan. Gotcha. And there he got into TV again. So his next project was The Norm Show, about an ex-hockey player who has to perform five years of community service in order to avoid jail time for tax evasion. Love it. And Artie joined him on that as well. Oh. To promote the sitcom... Guess where he made a triumphant appearance? David Letterman? SNL. Whoa! This time as host in October 1999. And awesome. he, he shreds them, too. What did he say in that monologue? I used to work here, then I was fired for not being funny. Boy, is that bad news. Uh, <laughs> but now, not only am I funny again, I'm so funny, I get to host. <laughs> it's true. Norm would also look at things very literally like that, like... Oh, I guess this means I'm funny again. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> According to you idiots. Yeah. And I think that's what people thought um, Shane Gillis was going to do. It kind of ribbed them for, uh, in his monologue like Norm did. But um, when he didn't, I think it was, uh, you know, a shock to people like, ah, oh, I wanted you to fucking. Yeah, Norm's already done it. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. We all know. It did get me to watch SNL for the first time in years, though. Yeah. The Shane Gillis <laughs> thing. <laughs> The Norm Show ended up lasting three seasons, 54 episodes on ABC. That's good. Not bad. Not, Not the magic 100 number for syndication, but still pretty good. Enough to get you a bit of money. And he followed that with A Minute with Stan Hooper, another sitcom about a writer who moves to a small Wisconsin town. I am not just inserting Wisconsin into this. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. And it comes in a lot. <laughs> Wisconsin is the Canada of America. That's why we are the funniest <laughs> motherfuckers in the country. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Take that, Boston. Yeah. I mean, look at the cheese head. You got to be funny to come up with that. Well, and hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and cheesy. Mm -hmm. So Stan Hooper, a uh, writer who moves to a Wisconsin town, and it's filled with eccentric, folksy people. And he does this in order to generate more material for his newspaper column, very similar to Newhart. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to make it more subversive as time went on, but it didn't even last one season before being canceled by Fox. 13 episodes, five unaired. Hmm. But Norm was not bothered by losing the sitcoms, nor was he concerned about his lack of movie roles. He didn't care about having a big Hollywood career. He was even afraid to call more famous friends like Adam Sandler for fear of sounding like he wanted something from them. Hey, I totally get it. Which is admirable. Like, it's a sacrifice he's making. Like, he would love to call Adam more, but he knows that Adam Sandler's constantly getting those calls. Of course. Like, can you put me in your movie? Yeah, I understand. So, yeah, Norm always did what he wanted, and he didn't think twice about turning things down that most others would jump on. For example, he had no FOMO when it came to the movie The Aristocrats. Ah, uh, that's fine. You know, that was one. Did you like that movie? I mean, I thought it was fun. It was yeah. Fun. You want to hear what Norm thought about it? Sure. From what I hear from the movies, all comedians will go into, well, a family goes into a talent agency, <laughs> and they say, we've got uh, this yeah. great act. Right. This guy, they came to me to do that movie. He's talking about The Aristocrats. Yeah, right. And uh, I said, uh, I've never heard that joke. You know? <laughs> we have secret parties at Chevy Chase's yeah, house. <laughs> it's the gayest thing I've ever heard. I'm like, you're going to make us all sound like it's, it's, that's so gay that we're all, we all go backstage and go, hey, well, well let's hear your version. Yeah. That doesn't happen. That's that's not true. that might have happened back in the 30s or something. But did in the you ever hear that? Easy? No. No, no I, I don't. That's the weirdest movie I ever saw. <laughs> 
I love that though. He really didn't care. Yeah. Because not even George Carlin could turn down appearing in The Aristocrat. <laughs> and Norm was just like, no, nah, not going to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because to him it was like phony because they tried to make it like every comedian's done this. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, I had never heard of it before the movie. No, me either. <laughs> every comedian's got their own version of it. Yeah. And then for a while, especially if you went to see the I'm movie, like, everyone would start telling, oh, I got my version yeah. of it. Yeah. Got, so got, then got, they're I, they're shitting in her mouth. And... Yeah, this, this family walks into a talent agency, and it turns out they, they got a little uh, trained squirrel with them. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. And what do they do to the squirrel? <laughs> I don't want to get into that. Norm also hated like obvious setups. And he would go on with Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller had this syndicated radio show. Yeah. And hilarious. Every appearance is gold. Yeah, I met Dennis. Tiny. Is he? Oh, they're all tiny. They're all short and gay and dead. There you go. <laughs> So this clip just demonstrates how Norm, <laughs> just listen to it. You know what show I would like to see you host, Norm? And this is the, the God's truth. The uh, I, I would like to see you host Catch a Predator. <laughs> I, I see that as being a good medium for you. What, what's your thoughts on the To Catch a Predator show? Oh, no, that's just, you just brought that up because I was telling that guy earlier I was thinking of that show to catch a predator. Well, thank you for unfolding my conceit here. I was trying to get you into the area you wanted I'm to talk sorry, about. I thought it was like a crazy coincidence because I just talked to that Christian dude about that. He's Jesus, Norm, could you diffuse this anymore? Okay, I'm sorry. It was a setup. I was putting the ball on the tee. I'm Cheech Marin. <laughs> you nice, man. <laughs> Now go ahead, knock it off. You're like Ed McMahon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, when you, so you don't want to talk about the Predator thing. Oh, yeah, man, to catch a Predator. No, I just, they I told just, me they said Norm wants to talk about Predator, and all of a sudden I'm at a Carson Wake here. Uh, it's not going to be funny now. All right. I, you know what I've done to you? It's like Jerry Lewis with Charlie Callis with the I Duck know, Hunter. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. And Dennis is exhausting with all those references. Yeah. I mean, my God, maybe the worst football commentator in the history of the sport. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good Lord almighty. It's like Barishnikov in the end zone over here. <laughs> no, football, please. <laughs> Lord, what are we talking about world history for? <laughs> so Norm had given up drinking and drugs mm. into adulthood. But one vice he did not give up was gambling. He went broke three times. Oh, I'm going to try to avoid that. Yeah, but he said that he actually enjoyed it, that it was a freeing feeling. It's the relief of it being over. You have no more money to go after. Because when you're in those like gambling you know, benders, mm -hmm. you just having any, even a, like $20 in there, it's like, all right, fuck it, take it out. Let's just get rid of this too. That's interesting. I've struggled with alcohol a bit myself, and I don't feel like gambling... Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Gambling is uh, in many ways more dangerous mm -hmm. yeah. like financially, but I guess in some ways not as dangerous. I don't know. It's a, it's a it's weird addiction, addiction right? Yeah. right? Because, well, food addiction That's is probably funny. the hardest one because you need food to survive. Right. Right. And yeah. gambling I mean, is much, tough because you go broke. And alcohol is tough because it just everything bad happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep, and they all give you the craps. Right. <laughs> And according to Artie Lang, Norm once won $60,000 and then proceeded to throw it into the ocean because he knew he was going to lose it anyways. No, he started with like 200000 and then it got all the way down to sixty, and he had it in a suitcase and just threw it in because he's like, fuck, I don't even want this amount. Well, this is why any suitcase you find floating in the ocean, just open it up. Yeah. You never know. Nobody ever found yeah. it. It's either a carcass or wada thousand dollar bills. Absolutely, but that's yeah in the ocean in Atlantic City, uh, somewhere around the dock. Yeah, it'll be the beginning of some kind of great mystery for you. <laughs> it's a mad, mad, mad world part two. It is. Everyone's searching for that suitcase now. And Norm also found it exhausting to buy a house because he said he bought a house once and it felt like a mausoleum. Hmm. Yeah. And to him, the worst part about gambling was not the losing of money, but the wasted time. Yep. Which I get because I've played poker at the casino where you go in at 1 p.m. and then suddenly it's 5 a.m. Yeah. Huh. 
Okay. It's just crazy. There's I mean, no that, sunlight, and you just get lost. No windows and no clocks on purpose to keep mm-hmm. you in there. And I guess with his mind, as, as a mathematical mind, I suppose poker is, because I kind of get bored playing poker. Yeah. I like my slot machines. Uh, the dumb version of gambling. More colorful, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, ding, 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 ding. I got ADHD. Like, look at really the, bad, and I'm like, this is just nice and peaceful here, isn't it? <laughs> look at the bright pictures. I need those bright pictures. And I don't even see them as bright pictures. <laughs> yeah. I see them as totally harmonious, about to give me money. Buckets of cash. Yeah. But I could see you in a poker game also cracking some jokes, having a good it's time. being horrible at poker. But, well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true, actually. How <laughs> annoying that would be. So despite all that, Norm did remain a poker enthusiast to his dying day. Every year he would make the trek to Las Vegas for the World Series of Poker. He appeared on Bravo Celebrity Poker Showdown, and he hosted a season of high-stakes poker on the Game Show Network. Hmm. And according to the Hendon Mob database, his best live tournament cash was $21,000. All right. Wow. I'll take it. Kyle, I'm going to be like Dennis Miller here. Uh, (laughs) Set me up. I heard you have a little poker story with Norm. (laughs) Oh, thanks, Byron. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, so I used to live down the street uh, from the Hollywood Park Casino in the South Bay of L.A. Oh. And was just playing with some people randomly. Turn around. I see Norm McDonald's playing on the table behind me. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, table change, please. Immediately go sit over with him. And uh, he couldn't have been a nicer guy. That's like, so awesome. Nobody realized it was him except for me. So I'm sitting there like a puppy dog. Like, I want to talk to this guy so bad. And um, we finally got to play. And he actually felt really bad because he was commentating on one of my hands. And I had ace king. Nice. One of the best pocket hands you can have. Yeah, besides pocket aces, yeah. best starting hand and hold them. Yes. All of a sudden, the flop comes, ace, king. Uh, this one, I check to let it go around. I'm not betting. Uh, Norm puts some money in, then some guy raises on Norm. Everybody else folds. I raise that guy, and then Norm's like, whoa, hey, I'm out. And then the dude shoves all in, and I shove all in. So there's like 700 bucks in the middle of the table now. Mm-hmm. And Norm is just like, wow, he's like, Looking at me, being like, I know you have the hand, talking about it over and over. And I was just like, shut the fuck up. Don't curse me. Uh, it's like ace, king, six. Then another turn is like a four. And then the last card to come is a three. And the guy's like, fucking let's go. And I was like, no fucking way. This guy just beat me. I fold, I turn over, ace, king. Dude had pocket threes. So, oh, that's literally got it on the river and took 700, like six, 700 bucks. To- I would have flipped the table. Yeah. <laughs> And Norm was just like, I'm so sorry. I was like saying that you won the hand and he felt awful about it. <laughs> but what a special afternoon to yeah. have played with Norm McDonald. And I almost got him a job because I was talking about how um, there's a casino down you in. You picked him up at the Home Depot? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jumped right in the truck. I was asking him if he ever played down in um, at the uh, gardens down in Long Beach. The and Hawaiian Gardens Hawa- Casino? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was like, no, he's like, I haven't been down there in a while. I was like, they have uh, cameras set up. So like people, they'll bring in like uh, comics and actors and stuff to do like celebrity commentating. Yeah. He's like, oh, I've done that. And I was like, I know I've seen your show. And uh, I was asking the the guy if um, Hollywood Park was going to start doing that. And he's like, yeah, he's like, we just don't have anyone famous enough. And I was just like, this guy right here. I was like, this is Norm McDonald. And he was like, oh, shit. He's like, I didn't even I'm not paying attention. He actually got Norm's email because they were going to start it up. And I didn't look at his email, but I saw that he had an AOL.com email still. Yeah, that's what celebrities (laughs) have. That's what celebrities have. Um, And then I went in like a few months later and asked the dude if uh, Norm was still in talks with them. And he said yes, but nothing ever came of it. Mm. I was like, damn, I almost got Norm a job. (laughs) Nice of you. Yeah, it's the effort that counts. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe he'd still be around today if you could have gotten them that damn job. Damn, it's my fault. Could be. <laughs> I say, though, it's worth losing that hand to spend time with Norm. Yeah. He had a joke about making fun of Byron Allen, being like, comics unleashed? I've never felt more leashed in my life. Right. And uh, so when I was leaving, I was just like, I got to say, thanks for making fun of my old boss. And he's like, oh, who's your old boss? And I was like, Byron Allen. And he's like, oh, man. He's like, that guy's a genius. And I was like, is he, though? And he was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> So overall, Norm was kind of an enigma to most people. 
Beneath the veneer of his comedy persona, there seemed to be some deep-rooted anger. He would get into bar fights even though he wasn't drinking. Wow. And he told The Hollywood Reporter in 2015, quote, People think I'm drunk all the time for some reason because my voice is all slurry. And when I'm talking on stage, I'm thinking a lot. When they ask what I'm drinking and I tell them I'm not, they either don't believe me or they're very disappointed. Saying you don't drink is like saying... I'm not a fun guy at all. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what, man? First of all, let's not call anyone a mushroom. Hello. Um, <laughs> don't do that to people at bars, though. If someone says, I don't, I'm don't, i not drinking, just trust that they're not drinking because if they do, they're going to throw you through a window. Right. right. So don't, Or they simply don't want to. Or they to. just don't want to drink. So, yeah, that's. Um, I can imagine that being very annoying because, you know, as someone who's not nearly as famous as Norm, but people have expectations when they meet you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you want to live up to those, you know? And I, I'm sure that Norm felt, you know, with his audience, there's a lot of guys out there and stuff like that. I'm sure it was, it was difficult for him to be like, no, nah, I'm not drinking. Ah, come on, do a shot, bro. You know, all, a lot yeah. of that stuff. Norm also didn't give a whip what anyone thought. So uh-huh. he wasn't really bothered if, you know, yeah. they thought he wasn't fun, especially when it came to his more conservative viewpoints, which went against the popular liberal tide. When he was on The View early on. Oh, yeah. The View is not even liberal. I don't know what that is. But he, it is like something out of hell. He called George W. Bush a great man, and he was excited to vote for him. <laughs> Everyone then, makes mistakes. And then then he starts saying, like, yeah, it'll be good to get the homicide out of the White House. <laughs> yeah. And then Barbara Walters goes, what are you talking about? And then Norm's like, well, you know, Bill Clinton, he's a murderer. He killed a guy. <laughs> it's a matter of fact. Yeah. And he kept, correct again. he kept going on and on about it to the point where I thought Barbara Walters was going to kick him off the stage. I mean, it's <laughs> ironic if you want, uh, you know, a non-homicidal president to vote for W, but all right, you know. Well, yeah. so we didn't have all the facts right, then, right. maybe. Yeah. But still, it shows to say it at that time in the entertainment industry, it was a very unpopular opinion. Right. Like anyone who showed up at Bush's inauguration was ridiculed. Right. Do you remember Ricky Martin did like a dance with him? Oh, and it was like <laughs> jeers everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> let people think how they want to think. Yeah. So Norm loved that, though, pushing people's buttons and subverting expectations. Never more apparent than during the Bob Saget roast in 2008. The best. He read from a G-rated joke book that his <laughs> dad had given to him before he died. <laughs> and Joel Gallen, the producer-director, gave him a note to be shocking. It was shocking. That's the point. That's how <laughs> awesome it was. Here, let's hear one of his jokes for fun. Bob, you have a lot of well-wishers here tonight, and a lot of them would like you to... Would like to throw you down one, a well. <laughs> they want to murder you in a well. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little harsh, but apparently they want to murder you in a well. It says here on this card. <laughs> now the Bob has a beautiful face, like a flower. Yeah, cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> He was the funniest one there. By far. Yeah. He's like, you got the heart of an eagle, (laughs) the mind of a rooster. Ladies and gentlemen, this man's for the birds. (laughs) (laughs) And some people thought he had gone insane based on that. They didn't understand (laughs) his humor. I also believe that he didn't want to do it. There was some speculation. Maybe I just heard that somewhere. It could be totally fucking wrong. Mm. But I was... I heard that he didn't really want to do the roast in the first place. He was like over roasts. Yes. Yeah. And so he's like, fine, I'll do it. But... Is what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. But another depressing undertone to that show is Artie Lang relapsed and was supposed to have been at the roast. Mm-hmm. And the last second, he didn't show up. And so Bob Saga and Norm thought that the producers were lying to them just to keep the show afloat. They thought Artie was dead uh-huh. and that they were lying just so that they wouldn't be too bummed to do the show. So the whole time this is going on, they're worried about Artie. Nope. Wow. Bob and Norm are dead, though. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. It's totally nuts. You get called home whenever the phone rings, but sometimes I don't I don't think that God wants him. <laughs> I don't think God wants Artie. 
He's tried a couple of times, but yeah. failed. Like, no, it's like, ho, ho, ho. And he just kicks him down the slide like a Christmas Yeah. <laughs> no, buddy. You can stab yourself all you want. You ain't coming in. Mm-hmm. And speaking of the phone call from God, in 2013, that's when Norm first got that call. Norm was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a cancer that forms, you know, the white blood cell the, and the plasma yeah. cell. Oh, not good. No, not good. Yeah. And in multiple myeloma, these cancerous cells build up in the bone marrow. So it's awful. Mm. Norm only told his immediate family and close friends, including Lori Joe Hoekstra, his best friend and producing partner. Norm was prescribed dexamethasone, which caused face swelling and weight gain. And Norm was more than happy to joke about his changing appearance. Why? Well, I thought you'd been gaining some weight. Yeah, I gained 45 pounds. What? Are you okay? Yeah, what's going on? I'm doing it for a movie. <laughs> what what are? What's the role? What are you playing, Jackie Gleason? <laughs> what do you mean? It's not a particular a movie. Role? I just think they need always need a fat guy <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> You're, You're paying paying it forward. forward. Yeah. All right, Peter. Super Dave. Also. Yeah. yeah. God damn. It's Everyone so, is dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on now. I mean, the name of your show is Death in Entertainment. That's true. true. <laughs> so heaven. It might also just be your show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, something's wrong with our show. Yeah, yeah. Alive and healthy in entertainment. That doesn't really ring true. <laughs> but the good news is heaven is going to be hysterical. Nice. There you go. Very <laughs> nice. Make God laugh. God, I hate that. <laughs> I do like the clown's prayer, though. Chris Farley liked it. Yeah. It's on my Instagram somewhere. At Ben Kissel one. <laughs> Don't forget to follow because I'm losing about a thousand a day. But then you probably gain about a thousand. I gain about two hundred. There you go. That's horrible. Nice. Norm underwent chemotherapy and then disappeared for four months to receive stem cell transplants in Arizona. Mm. He would check in using the familiar pseudonym Stan Hooper. Oh. Which his show was called. That's how unsuccessful the show was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, no one thought that it. was hilarious. Right. <laughs> he must have thought that was hilarious. <laughs> the cancer went into remission. Norm started to search for meaning in faith and spirituality. He wasn't particularly religious, but he did wonder what was out there. He got into some of this on his appearance. He got into some of these topics on WTF with Mark Marin. You're trying to get to some spirituality in your life. I'm trying to because all I, uh, the only real joy I get, uh, other than I love watching comedy, but uh, anything deeper than that is I read a lot of literature and stuff. I'm not, uh, I'm not educated. Like I never had any schooling, uh -huh. and I don't read nonfiction much. But I read lots of literature, uh -huh. and um, like who. Uh, Tolstoy, oh, yeah, yeah. Faulkner, but the um, faith keeps coming up, and yeah. I'm like, these motherfuckers are smart. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I was always like, you know, uh, Pryor is this fucking most deep, profound guy I yeah. ever fucking heard. You know, yeah. from my limited perspective, and then all of a sudden I'm reading books. I'm like, holy fuck. This guy knows everything. Like, yeah. I was reading Tolstoy. I was like, fuck, one word, yeah. one sentence, this guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but then I was like, why are all these guys, uh, it all comes down to faith. You know, it seems to every fucking great novel I read, it seems like faith is the, the only um, um, salvation. Yeah. But I don't know how to get it. It was his, faith was his white whale, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Physically, the chemo had left him with nerve damage, which caused severe pain in his feet. Mm. He compared it to walking on shards of glass or through fire. Jeez. Dang. So he didn't leave the house much. He didn't particularly enjoy going to restaurants and sitting there. Right. Obviously didn't go to bars. Uh, he could no longer play tennis and golf, two things he loved. Stand up, though remained his first love, and that he never gave up, and it kept him busy. He could go through hundreds of shows before repeating material the same way or in the same order. He befriended comedy store manager Adam Egit, and they started a podcast together, which is what I played a clip from before. Oh, right. The, oh, that's that guy. The fat joke. That's oh, that guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, and they had a good rapport. They had, both had the kind of delivery that matched each other yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense I don't know him. He, he books the comedy store or something? Yeah. Yeah. He used to. Sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And kind of took a backseat to Norm's jokes on that show. Right. Well, he wasn't like the star. 
So the YouTube show was called Norm MacDonald Live, and it ran for 39 episodes before Netflix bought the format and changed the name to Norm MacDonald Has a Show uh, in 2018. That's a rare time where I kind of like the correction or the change. <laughs> just the name or the whole thing? Savor the flavor, Netflix. You don't Can't. fucking deserve it ever. <laughs> but I like, I like Norm MacDonald Has a Show. Yeah, that is pretty good. In 2015, Norm made an emotional appearance on one of Letterman's last shows. He's the last guy to do stand-up on it. And he was pr- basically bawling. Yeah. And he said, quote, Mr. Letterman is not for the mawkish, and he has no truck for the sentimental. If something is true, it is not sentimental. And I say in truth, I love you. And then he starts crying. It looks like he's at a funeral. Yeah. It's it's crazy. very emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a guy who was always so deadpan, it was a weird thing to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how important these people are. I still have the memory of watching Johnny Carson's last show with my mother. Mm -hmm. She was crying. I mean, Bette Miller was out there singing like... Yeah, man, these are important people in people's lives. That's yeah. the quintessential goodbye, isn't it? The Bette Midler. Oh, it's the best. One for the road. It's the best. So good. Speaking of deadpan, or just dead. Jeez. In 2016, his son Dylan's friend Michael died of a pill overdose at Norm's condo mm. while house-sitting and taking care of Norm's cat. Mm. Jeez. It's not good. No, it's... They were on vacation. Right. And then right. this happened while they're gone. How disturbing. Sure. Not good for the cat either. Oh, well, maybe it is good for the cat. Uh, some fancy cats feast. Care. Yeah, cats. <laughs> Jesus. They'll eat you within 24 hours. That's what they say. Yeah. Really? Yes. That's what they say. Within 24. Yes. Yeah. Man, that's P- why, probably sooner. That's why That's why I eat so much at night because I say I'm eating for two. Yeah. What if I die? What if I die? Well, it's good to know that your cat will survive, though, <laughs> if anything happens. <laughs> I mean, my fucking cat. <laughs> Everyone leaves their animals with me. Yep. It's true. Everyone. Because you're lovable. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so remember that book we heard an excerpt of based on a true story that was half not true? Yeah. <laughs> well, that came out in 2016. And it was a blend of autobiography and absurdist fiction. And this was inspired by the way he took a liking to Twitter. And so he would have these tweet-a-thons where he would basically write a novel. It was just golf. And then sometimes he would just do golf breakdowns. Yeah, Yeah, he would do these droll play-by-plays for sports. Yeah. He said that he wrote multiple books and not just drafts, like totally different books, and then landed on this one. And so he made the rounds to promote it including The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, where he directly followed the infamous Donald Trump hair tussle segment. All right. He was there that night for history. All right. There you go. A little hair tussle (laughs) here, hair tussle there. Why not? And then two years later, Norm would be bumped from the same show following his own controversial headlines. And I'll get into that right now. This is like his last brush with... The bullshit culture that he loathed. In 2018, when he was promoting his rebranded Netflix talk show, Norm commented on the Me Too movement in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter. He said he was glad the Me Too seemed to have slowed down a little bit and then spoke about friends Roseanne Barr, (laughs) Louis C.K., and Chris Hardwick, (laughs) saying that Very few people have gone through what they have, losing everything in one day. And so people were pissed off saying, like, oh, what about the victims? Well, and then everyone got lumped together. Yes. So there are Harvey Weinsteins out there. Mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein, obviously, himself. But everyone was uh, cast with the same brush. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's what he was referring to. Right. And Roseanne, this was fresh from her uh, Ambien tweet. Oh, that's the Valley Valley, Valley one. Yeah, the, and the bitch was white. The bitch was white. Yeah. Again, Twitter is just, just it's not going to help you. Back in the day, remember when comedians that we know and still do used to get jobs off of it? Oh yeah. I don't think it happens anymore. No. Net the negative. shit my dad says. One of my best. That? One of my best friends of all time, uh, Josh Gondelman, got. Um, uh, book deal off of Modern Seinfeld, and it was a huge. Oh, and it was a great Twitter, mm, Twitter uh, yeah. profile he had. It yeah, was hilarious. And he just hosted the uh, Writers Guild Awards like two days ago. That's awesome! Wow. <laughs> so yeah, he's got quite the career after breaking from Twitter like that. 
So it's either hit or miss, I guess, because then no, you have miss. you have the Gilbert <laughs> Gottfrieds of the world that made a couple of Japan earthquake jokes. <laughs> oh, Gilbert, yeah. <laughs> then he's Lord. fired from Affleck. <laughs> yeah. This is some friend, Jimmy Fallon, because after this broke, Jimmy canceled his a- appearance on The Tonight Show. Jimmy, I don't... While Norm was in the building still. That's... He was about to go on the show. What? And was bumped. Jimmy was like, I'm so sorry, Norm, but people are crying. And, you know, I, I just, it feels like it's going to ruin the show if I have you on. What the fuck? It's just, again, and the double standard, Jimmy, he, speaking of drinking. Oh, yeah, gosh. Dang, anyone has ever been to Pioneer's Bar in uh, in New York City, they ran into him a couple of times. I mean, that guy's yeah. a little, he's a little piss fire. So yeah. it's all just fucking bullshit. Yeah. And norm took to twitter saying he was deeply sorry and then he further explained his statements with an appearance on the howard stern show he said quote i wish i never had to do interviews especially print interviews they ask you questions that maybe you don't want to answer and i'm a fucking dumb guy then he went on to say You'd have to have Down syndrome to not feel sorry for the victims. Yeah. <laughs> because he said Down syndrome because he didn't want to use the R word. Yeah. So then he had to go on to The View to apologize for that apology <laughs> and called his words unforgivable. Yeah. But then people in the comments think that he was being sarcastic. I think that they're all very forgivable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everything's very, very forgivable. <laughs> But it's like that thing you were talking about. What did you say earlier where I thought he was joking? Oh, where he said that, um, like, talking about death and comedy and stuff, it has no place in comedy because everybody's parents die. So who cares about if, if your dad did or whatever? There's some truth to that now that I'm thinking about it, the fact that he hid his own battle. Yeah. But at the same time, he was also sarcastic a lot. So, yeah. you, you know, I don't know. <laughs> That's Norm. Yep. The Netflix talk show lasted a season. I think that didn't help, that whole episode. Sure. But, so throughout the later 2010s, Norm continued to do a bunch of stand-up, play poker, and appear on a bunch of shows, including the Orville, where he portrayed a gelatinous blob named Yafit. Oh, man, that's what I want to do. <laughs> it's so really cool. funny. Be awesome. <laughs> All the good gelatinous blob jobs are being taken over. Yeah. By Canadians. Yeah. I'm telling you, wall on the northern border. That's going to go with my fuck platform. Build the wall. Letterman was one of his final guests on the talk show. And I watched that one. They talked about mortality. You've been thinking about your mortality a lot lately? Or? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you turn 70 and uh, it's uh, you can't run from it. Ah, fuck, I was hoping you could. (laughs) You know where I differ from a lot of people? When I... Really? (laughs) Really? You're different from a lot of people. When I have my uh, funeral, you know? Yeah. And you know, most of these funerals, uh, crying and uh, sad and everything like that. And... uh, uh, that's what I'd like, you know. <laughs> I've heard of other ones. Let's have a party. Ah, ah, ah. Whoa, whoa. No party. There'll be a lot of party days later. But right now, this is, the, I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, people should be talking, crying. That's so hilarious. Well, there you go. He dealt with a morbid subject there. Yeah, I think specifically he didn't like to talk about it because he had a crippling fear of death. Don't we all? Yeah. Eh, That's why he said he liked to stay busy a lot, so he didn't think about it, because if he sat too long by himself, he'd start just thinking about it. I don't don't have any fear of death. No? I I definitely do. I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember, like, the... Yeah, I think I remember being born, just being like, what the fuck? (laughs) What is this? Get me out of this. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the look who's talking credits. Yeah. (laughs) I wonder, maybe I will when I get there. Yeah, and I'm like, oh my, I don't know. I it's gonna like, be crazy either way. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so inevitable that it's mm-hmm. like, why bother having fear? Yeah, doesn't matter. True. In early 2020, the cancer returned. Now I have a fear of cancer. Yeah, <laughs> I have a fear of going through chemo and dying. Yeah, I think death is. Thank God he got to die after all that chemo. Mm. What a fucking pain in the ass that is. Yeah. Norm had been planning to tape a couple shows to develop for a Netflix special. 
before the double whammy of COVID and cancer. Mm. He didn't let that get in the way of his plans, though. He summoned best friend Lori Joe over, who didn't have to travel far because she lived in the same building complex. Nice. Since the late 1990s, she was by his side for everything. Friends say theirs was a relationship deeper than most marriages. Okay. And here's an excerpt from a Washington Post article about Norm's final years. On the afternoon of June 28, 2020, Norm MacDonald had an idea. This was not a normal day. The next morning, he would have a stem cell transplant at the City of Hope Medical Center, just east of Los Angeles. They set up in Lori's condo. An HD camera captured McDonald from the front, an iPhone from the side. For lighting, Hoxtra flipped on a bright lamp, and McDonald, clean-shaven and wearing headphones and a blue sport coat over a pink golf shirt, sat at her kitchen counter. And for the next 54 minutes, without stopping, McDonald delivered his material. Wow. I don't want to get my hair colored no more, you know? I don't want anybody painting my hair black. On account, I don't want to die and then uh, be surprised. You know what I mean? Go, damn, I look good. And then God goes, well, I made your hair white. I, What do you think that was all about? I was telling you, to get your affairs in order, for God's sake. <laughs> so he looks pretty good there. A little but gaunt. He, so. Yeah. His brother, Neil, had flown in from Canada to donate blood for Norm's transplant, and he did undergo that the next day. At first, the results were positive. He got stronger and put on some weight. His mom, Fern, then in her 80s, and I believe she's still alive, Mm. moved into Norm's apartment complex to help take care of him. They often posted funny clips together on social media. Norm was feeling so much better for a time that he cranked out a screenplay based on his book, based on a true story. Mm. And then he started a YouTube series called Quarantined. In the series, he would interview comedian friends like Roseanne. And I have a snippet from that, but I noticed he looks way more frail in these than that Netflix special. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Couldn't feel better. (laughs) Okay, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say it. Uh, you, You don't look so hot, man. Look terrible. What? I feel great. I feel great. Yeah. Wow. I guess that's all you can say. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I would say. I don't think I would tell him he looks terrible. But yeah, yeah. I get it. They're just joking around. <laughs> They're joking around. They're just being kids. Norm managed to survive the first year of the pandemic without many complications, but his health quickly deteriorated in early 2021. Doctors recommended another stem cell transplant in March. This time, however, there was no improvement and his health plateaued. As usual, though, Norm kept a good attitude. He remained hopeful, even planning future gigs with his comedian buddies. Colin Quinn told the Washington Post, quote, Speaking of secretive, He booked a gig with me in August to do some casinos, and we texted each other, hey, I can't wait to do the gig. Yeah, me neither. So Norm really believed he was going to last longer. Or at least just wanted to have something to look forward to and a little normalcy. Yeah. In July 2021, Norm went in for what was usually an outpatient round of chemo at the City of Hope Cancer Center. They ordered him to stay overnight this time due to pandemic protocol. But he ended up developing a nasty infection that night Mm. and had to stay longer. In fact, City of Hope is where he would spend the rest of his ailing days. Mm. Norm believed he would recover, but he wasn't getting any better. In late July, he managed to record a voiceover for the Orville. Oh. He and Lori Joe found a private room in the hospital and zoomed it in from there. Wow. A month later, he watched his living room stand-up footage from his hospital bed and made some notes. Norm's health continued to deteriorate. He died on September 14th, 2021, six weeks after his last round of chemo. Sucks. Yeah. Lori Joe told Deadline, quote, He was most proud of his comedy. 
He never wanted the diagnosis to affect the way the audience or any of his loved ones saw him. Norm was a pure comic. He once wrote that a joke could catch someone by surprise. It should never pander. He certainly never pandered. Norm will be missed terribly. Absolutely. I have a clip here that I think explains everything. He admired the actor Richard Farnsworth, who was in a bunch of movies like The Natural and okay. Misery. And his last movie was The Straight Story. And he was secretly dying of cancer. Okay. Nobody knew it. Everyone gets cancer and dies. <laughs> Like that's what a great. What if we just ended the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know that it's almost like uh, the height of narcissism to think that you're uh, you're going to um, you know you're going to be so brave as to uh, talk about it in person, right? Whereas all you're doing is just garnering sympathy for yourself. Well, I guess it's that's a, true. How is that brave? It seems cowardly to me. It seems much braver to me. Like I remember, Richard Farnsworth was a old character actor, and he did a, a David Lynch movie called The Straight Story, mm -hmm. and uh, riddled with cancer. You know, his last movie, and uh, very frail. And it's a fantastic movie if you ever get a chance to uh, see it. So, anyways, the point of it is that Richard Farnsworth was nominated for an, uh, an Academy Award for the movie, and if he had said he was he was filled with cancer, he would have won for sure. Sure. But instead, he didn't say it. Right. Good point. And didn't win. Or they wouldn't have nominated him because was he really acting? Mm. We simply don't know. Mm. There's a lot to think about that. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that does give a lot of insight into the way he handled it. He didn't want to bother anyone or have anyone think of him differently. Absolutely. Mm. People are suffering. They don't. He doesn't need the. He wanted to give love. You mm -hmm. know? He wanted to give comfort, and he didn't receive it. Sadly, by the masses. And comedy was the way he gave love. Absolutely, making people laugh, and I that that shows. He, I mean, he was doing that to his dying day. Yep, working, still working on his material. Right, giving notes on his special while he's dying. Yeah. A private memorial show was held eight months after his death at the Fonda Theater here in L.A. with his friends and family. MC Conan O'Brien, who Norm made so many memorable appearances on Conan's show, yeah. he relayed a story about the time Norm was booked to do a last-minute segment on The Tonight Show when Conan hosted it. Norm took a 15-second joke about a moth visiting a psychiatrist and stretched it into a five-minute essay on existential dread. That moth bit's hilarious. It is. Okay. It, it's... <laughs> Conan closed by saying, quote, He lived in his own strange world, populated by hobos, French Canadians, card sharps, farmers, hooligans, and for reasons no one will ever understand, Frank Stallone. <laughs> Selfishly, I don't feel badly for Norm. I feel badly for all of us. There you go, Conan. Norm MacDonald, Nothing Special, premiered on Netflix in May 2022. It featured his set from June 2020, that same thing he filmed casually in his condo. And then they added a roundtable discussion of his life and career with people like Conan and yeah. others. The critical and fan response was overwhelmingly positive, and it was nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Variety Special, ultimately losing to Adele one night only. <laughs> this right. category is so weird. Wow. The other nominees were Harry Potter, Return to Hogwarts, and an evening with Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. I think Hogwarts might be a worse way to die than cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine Norm saying, like, yeah, you know what? They deserve to win. Who cares? Yeah, like, who cares? Exactly. Yeah. You gotta buy the damn thing, you know? You win an Oscar, you gotta buy the fucking thing. Oh, that's true. So wow. Stupid. Who gives a shit? Just like the Hollywood star. Yeah, it makes sense, though. I'd buy it. Well, yeah. We all would. I wouldn't buy an Oscar. I'd, I mean, I would win it, but I would not buy it. Uh, okay. I would not buy it, no. You have For your... 10 bucks on Hollywood Boulevard. Gives a <laughs> you have your uh, standards. Yeah. It's just who cares? <laughs> Some people said that Norm lost his battle with cancer on that fateful day in 2021, but 
according to Norm, that wasn't exactly the case. Listen to this. I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure if the cancer dies, I mean, if you die, the cancer also dies at exactly the same time. So that, to me, is not a loss. That's a draw. That's a, you know what I mean? It's not like the cancer's going to jump up and go, ah, I'm Uncle Bert's wife. Where is it? I won fair and square. It's not venom. That's great. I love that. Yep. That brings us to... Final thoughts. Ben. Final thoughts. Norm MacDonald, he lived an incredible life. Thank God he had one, and uh, he made my childhood so much better, and he guided a lot of my comedy also. I mean, that whole SNL cast, it was like the slapstick of Chris Farley, just the silly songs of Sandler, the straight man of of Spade, and then the snark of of, uh, Norm, man. I mean, I feel like that cast is – I just took like bits of all of those people. (laughs) <laughs> and that just created my own life. That's so, yeah, he was just mm-hmm. such an icon and one of the goats. Yeah, absolutely iconic. Uh, I love that we're doing this right after O.J. Simpson died as one final thorn in O.J.'s side. His era of SNL, like we said, classic. Mm-hmm. One of the best ever, if not the greatest ever run. Uh, Dirty Work was a very formative movie for me growing up. And uh, to see all those guys in one movie doing, they did the movie for themselves. And yeah. I mean, that was kind of to its own detriment because it didn't do well in the box office, but it's become a cult classic it's that everybody knows classic, and yeah. loves sure. now. Yeah. I mean, Big Lebowski didn't do well either. Yeah, you know? exactly. But yeah, uh, rest in peace to Norm. Absolutely. Yeah. And for me, I just admire him so much. He did what he wanted the way he wanted to do it and truly did not care what people thought. Yeah. And Norm knew people are wrong sometimes, including himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So who cares? Yeah. Pretty amazing, though, that the first comedy club show he did had that manager, even though he bombed the manager that was like, no, you are funny because there's too many people in the business that go just off of crowd reaction and don't even think about the person that's on stage. Right, right. If they hear the people laughing, they're like, oh, they must be funny. Instead of if this person's bombing, the crowd might not be the right crowd for them. Right. And now, of course, it's totally opposite with the social media credentials that yeah. must be jacked up before <laughs> you can even uh, you know, get in the door. So, yeah, yeah. Norm, what a legend. That's the Don Olmeyer type person though exactly the business people they're the ones that rely on how other people view things us we just watch something and if it's funny if it's entertaining that's enough yeah and i know i played a million clips on this i could not help myself for some reason i love it (laughs) but i'm gonna play this one last clip only because i teased it so after all his oj jokes on snl he hosted the ESPYs in 1998. Oh, my God. This got some reactions. And as Kyle mentioned, OJ died this week. And so all these clips have resurfaced. People are praising Norm for his bravery at the time to not be afraid of tackling the subject right. head on. He became the first defensive player to win the Heisman Trophy. And congratulations, Charles. That is something that no one can ever take away from you. Unless you kill your wife and a waiter, in which case... <laughs> Do you guys hear that? You've got mail. We got a mail bag here for everyone. What do we got, Kyle? Oh, my goodness. On Apple Podcast Reviews, Adam87EC uh, has a five-star review, thank you very much, entitled Whistle Past the Graveyard. Uh, he says, understanding the therapeutic and completely human attraction towards gallows humor, these guys take the grimy, revolting side of entertainment and use it as a launching pad for some dark but ultimately mostly respectful humor. Uh, these guys kill in this podcast is worth your time. All right. Wow. Thank, thank you, Adam. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. And on the Aaron Carter episode that uh, we all did together, Sweetie Hog 7249, Sweetie Hog <laughs> said, thank you for sharing Aaron's story. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of good um, reviews and comments that came in on that episode. So, 
Yeah, I think that's uh, about it. If you want to follow us uh, on Instagram, YouTube, all the good stuff at Death and Entertainment. Ben, what are your handles? I'm um, Ben Kissel one on Instagram, Twitter. Ben Kissel, don't you really use it? Uh, so go to the Instagram, get my numbers up, please. God Almighty, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, nothing really matters. Um, and then I'm going to be starting my own show in June. I'm getting my team together, yep. and I hope you will continue to visit us. Of course, yes. of course. Seats always open. The next big thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then please. Please visit patreon.com slash death and entertainment where you can see tons of extra content. Lots. The latest one is the Larry King, Brittany Murphy, and Simon Monjack interview. That's Debacle. Really <laughs> bizarre. Yeah. And there's a lot of other stuff there. And what else? I think that's it. Let him go. Okay. Well, <laughs> until next week. Don't go dying on us. Bye. You have just heard... A true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. 